or my guest is here. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of Bayina and Friends. This is Franz de Court Jr., author, publisher with Thoroughbred Books. Today is Thursday, October 29th, 2020, the year of clear vision. So we have another great show for you guys this afternoon. Um, we have a very special guest um, that's going to be interviewed by our gracious host and resident scholar, Professor Baina Bello, joining us live from IET. Hello, Professor Bello. Greetings, Jumbo Hotel. How are you? All of you, how are you? Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us one more time and for us to exchange information that is important to our people, information that will build us, information that will give us light in, uh, in darkness, information that will show us the way out of slavery, out of domination information that will show us the way to our divine self. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Brother Joel Mackel, who's joining us. And, uh, but before we start, as you know, we have a little exercise. We must take care of the body. It's vital that we, are, we consciously care for our health. Health is not when you become sick and you go to doctor. Health is every thought you put in as far as what you do with your body. And as we've said before, breathing and drinking are the two most important elements to our staying healthy, to our being healthy, to our enjoying life. So without further ado, let us sit wheel straight, back straight, feet on the ground, hands on the knees, and we are going to take seven deep breaths together. As I guide you, you take it in as slowly as I speak or as quickly as I speak. You take it in through the nostrils and send it out through the mouth. But more than that, we want to do conscious breathing. That means breathing with purpose. So we're breathing in great health for all of our people, not just for ourselves. We're breathing for those who are not. We're breathing for those who are not aware that they should pay attention to their breath. So we're breathing in great health for all of our people as others create disease and send disease out to, to people. We are going to take care of our people and breathe in health and breathe out prosperity. That's what we're doing. We're keeping health and prosperity in the mind. Let's go. Back straight, shoulders straight, feet on the ground, solid, two hands on the knees, and we breathe in, 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 Hold, breathe out, 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 relax. Breathe in, 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 hold. Breathe out, 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 relax. Breathe in, in 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 hold breathe out 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 relax remember we breathe in health and breathe out prosperity breathe in 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 hold breathe out out, out, relax, breathe in, in, 
in, hold, breathe out, 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 relax, breathe in, 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 hold, breathe out, 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 relax. Thank you. Remember, do it for yourself, by yourself, as many times a day as you think of it. Take care of your breath and you will care for your health. Also be mindful that you're drinking good water and enough water. Those two elements are key. And the third element is movement. Walk. Don't send somebody to pick it up to get it for you. Get up and go get it. Walk to the store nearby. Don't turn on your car for a two minutes walk. Take advantage. Walk, please. That's the best way. Walking and swimming are the best ways to take care of our body. So if we don't have a swimming pool, hey, we got to walk it. Walk it. Thank you. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be very healthy. Next year, this time, not only do I want you healthy, I want you younger than you are today. So we have to work at it to make it happen. All right. So we go to our next step. Le nous tout ça c'est qui te créer gourmet bâti lité pour peuple noir pas péri. Non non tout si la yo qui te choisi marcher courir à joindre l'en mort. Les yo pas ouais qui Jean pour tracer route liberté. Moi saluer toutes amis Baina and friends. In the name of all those ancestors who created, built, fought, so African children will not be erased on our planet Earth. In the name of those who chose to rush up and kiss death rather than live without tracing a way to freedom, I greet you, all the supporters, contributors, energy givers to Baina and Friends. This week, Baina and Friends welcomes Brother Joel Mac. McCall. Before we meet him, let us take a few minutes to take control of our breathing, which we just did. So we go straight to our poem, Freedom, which you and I, Brother Joel, will be reading. We each will take one paragraph. We'll each will read one paragraph. All right. Would you like to start? Sure. Freedom, question mark. Our first mistake was that we thought of freedom as a place rather than a continuation of a struggle. Tyranny never sleeps. Our second mistake was that we thought of freedom as a goal rather than as a launching pad from which to reach our goals. Without purpose, freedom hardly matters. Our third mistake was that we thought that freedom would make us free. That, however, is license, not freedom at all. Freedom is being shackled to identity, purpose and direction and being in constant pursuit. Written nearly 5,000 years ago by Ethiopian philosopher Amun Hotel. And we gladly say thank you, thank you, thank you to brother, to our ancestor Amun Hotel for these words. Now, as you read this, brother, what does it, what touches you? What does it mean to you? Well, the, the word shackle at the end. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, sir. We can hear you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, I, I, 
I've been a participant in the beginning, uh, from the beginning with the, the friends, and I give thanks, uh, Marbello, for um, this opportunity to, to um, be in this conversation, in this form. Um, but just now, the word shackle kind of hit me. Um, you know, the shackles have changed over so much time and so much space over the last five or so de uh, centuries and, and further back. But um, I like how it's used here um, by a mental tap. Yes, being shackled to identity. So, how do we understand being shackled to identity, purpose, and direction? That's a question for me, or I'm sorry. Uh, no, we're just having a conversation, you know, a question okay. for us, you know. Yeah. Uh, to me, being shackled to identity means that no matter what happens, if I live a certain way, even a nuclear bomb cannot separate me from my identity. I could go through hell 1,000 times and back. That seed of my identity will always be there. And the way for me to nourish it is to have purpose and give myself direction. And being in constant pursuit. That means anytime I say, oh, Baina, this is great, you finished, that's wonderful, this is the end of that, then I am out of freedom. Because in freedom, purpose, direction, activity is constant. It does not stop. To me, that that paragraph, that's where it takes me. Um, my other paragraph that I uh, enjoy a lot is the shortest one. Tyranny never sleeps. What do you see there, Brother Joel McCall? Well, um related to the shackled, I, I was just thinking of um, Alex Haley's movie, um, Roots, where there was um, his ancestor who came in through the port of Annapolis, found himself under the total coercion and captivity, the tyranny of the slavers in Maryland. And it, what I was just thinking of is there was a, a scene in it when he's actually taking a rock and he's breaking the shackles off. And all of a sudden, they, they suddenly break, finally. And he, he freezes in the moment of his acting. And they, I guess they let the cameras roll in, in 1977 when they were filming the, the TV miniseries um, of his story, Roots. But um, I think that that moment when he's just looking at the broken shackles, he's trying to get free. He's got identity, purpose, and direction. and even though the tyranny is in the background, it never sleeps. There's a moment when he, he's saying, oh my gosh, I, I actually broke the shackles. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm stopped. But then one of the other enslaved Africans comes in, uh, Fiddler, the, the character, and then all of a sudden you're brought back into the tyranny of what that means, um, that the anti-black violence that's hanging over um, our, our it's, a, it's an environment, it's the weather. I think um, Baba John Henry Clark says something like that. And that's, that's very much in line with tyranny never sleeps, is that it's, it, as you were just speaking about, about the shackled and the, and the purpose and direction, he wanted to get back to his, um, Mende, I think they were Mende people that he was taken from in, in, in Wolof in, in Senegal. He had to get back to them. 
he had to keep going until they ampute they they you know they caught him and they amputated one of his limbs um so yeah those two right there that i just that just hit me right now yes and every part of our our street personal or national as we always have those two elements at work here and he never sleeps most of us are not aware of that and it also tyranny is in every form in every area it's in our heads we sometimes you know i think in fact if i take back the same image that you use when he he spent all this time trying to break those chains once he did he couldn't believe it at first because you know wait what ha what happened here you know hey they broke <laughs> You know, it wasn't, I broke them, but you know, it was like, he was doing it yet somewhere. He didn't quite believe he could. And then here he was in front of himself, the victorious one, but he couldn't even quite digest that victory. And then Fiddler of course arrive and start putting more doubt, more everything you know so through fedler tyranny came back into the picture you know so we have to be it's a very powerful scene and we have to be very much aware that everything we're doing today we are in that kind of position we are in that kind of position so uh the, the third paragraph tells us our second mistake so you see, uh, one of the other thing I enjoy with this poem, where well, I've been reading it for what, 30 years and never tired of it. Uh, first, the title, Freedom? Question, he's inviting us to think about freedom. Have you been thinking about freedom? Do you know what freedom is? How do you perceive freedom? So he's inviting us He's not declaring like these people usually do. You know, he is inviting the, 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 the conversation on that topic. And he points out our first mistake. We take freedom for a place. Points out our second mistake. We think of freedom as a goal. And our third mistake. We think that I'm free. I could do anything I want to do. That does not exist. <laughs> freedom comes in with laws and rules and regulations i cannot say yeah i'm free i could go up on top of the roof and drop myself on the ground sure you could do it but let's see how you you will pick up after right so we have to make then also that shows this is not a purpose if i say well my purpose is to to be able to jump off the whatever no that's not a purpose. Do something that will take you somewhere, that will bring something that will serve the community, not hurt the community. So, oh, thank you very much. Unless you have another comment, Brother jo Joel McCall. You're done. All right, let us advance. In the name of Fondation Felicité, of the volunteers, FF volunteers, all admirers of genealogy, all those who are eager to learn how to go about getting their genealogy started, we're happy to welcome Brother Joel Macau to share some vital info with us on genealogy. Brother Macau, would you kindly share with us how would you like to present yourself, first of all? Uh, thank you, my bello. Um, my name is Brother Joel McCall, and um, I run a, a company called Reagen Business Group here in Boston, Massachusetts. And the mission of Reagen, uh, first of all, I guess I should explain the word Reagen. Um, on my grandfather's parents side 
I know there was some black folks who fled from Northern Virginia counties to Jamaica, but I don't have any peoples that I know of in Jamaica besides friends, um, but I love the Patois. And so when I heard the words, um, when I incorporated in um, 2003, I heard the words brethren, sistren, idren. So the, um, the Jamaican uh, abuse of the queen's language, they say I and I representing the we, which is very much like the community you have here with the friends and, and, and the, the circle. So I love the word idren, meaning brothers and sisters, brethren and sistren, and I put the prefix re in front of it to make the, the company name Reidrin Business Group. And so our mission is to help black folks think better of ourselves. And it comes in many different ways. I run um, an education company loosely, but we do all types of things like homework help for kids, genealogy classes, business design, all type of things. But it's all with the excuse of um, helping ourselves think better of ourselves. And um, I guess that's how I would represent you most quickly as far as my work and my purpose. Thank you very much. Uh, now, let's go back a little bit down the way before we go dive into genealogy. What kind of a young man, a teenager were you? <laughs> um, I was a very, well, I still am a very introverted and quiet uh, person, but I think I was uh, a very observant person. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Boston in, um, you know, a very strong family background. And, you know, I wasn't trying to be all up in the classroom uh, doing this and that, and, and I wasn't a particularly a strong student, but I was a good observer and I loved to read. Um, always loved to read. And so this was, uh, before I date myself, this is before the time of, uh, uh, you know, Windows 95 and, and the internet and all of this kind of thing. So um, it wasn't as easy to archive the, the, the things to, to, to get access to the archive, especially growing up in such a small town. Um, but over time, I came to um, pay real close attention, especially to my grandfather. I think my grandfather as a young man, uh, as a young, you know, as a teenager and um, middle childhood up through, through college, um, one of my greatest mentors was my grandfather, and he was a phenomenal storyteller. And uh, we'll get into, uh, you know, his background and, and all of this, but um, he was a World War II vet, and he always had time for me. So whenever my family, we'd leave Massachusetts and go visit um, where my parents grew up in East Orange, New Jersey, uh, to visit family for the holidays and this and that. And I spent a lot of time with him. And he told me a lot about life, about his travels in the world. And um, I would say, I, I, you know, curiosity and observation and listening. And then of course, reading characterized a lot of my, my youth. Excellent, thank you. I hope everybody has noticed curiosity, observation, Reading, three key elements, three key ways of learning, of acquiring information. All right, now, would you tell us about your family? Sure. Um, well, I just started to you say that- You uh, already have the grandfather. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just started to say my parents, um, met and were married in East Orange, New Jersey. My father was born in Washington, D.C. Um, and were, he basically worked for Polaroid Corporation here in Massachusetts. So it's a very interesting 
um, coming together of, of forces. I was born in Boston, but my family moved to the suburbs. And for those of you who are not really familiar with um, Metro Boston or Greater Boston, there's a, a, a basically a, a, a throughway that goes all the way around cir circumvent, uh, circle in circles um, Boston with the port on, on the east side, of course. But it's very similar to Silicon Valley, and it's called the Route 128 uh, corridor. And it, it basically was kind of um, a feeder for the Harvards and the MITs and all of this and all the um, technology companies uh, outside of Boston uh, as a development area for you know, rejuvenating the Metro Boston area in the 1950s. So I grew up in the outer stretches of bedroom community up there in the, you know, some of the best public schools you could have access to. And I didn't have one, one real teacher in my whole career until I got to college, not one real mentor, uh, somebody that, that would help me express myself. So I leaned heavily on my parents, on my family, on my, um, my uh, sister, my aunts and uncles, and extended family in the South. Um, but at any rate, my father basically worked for Polaroid for 35, 40 years. And while we were, while I was growing up in that kind of insulated area, at the same time, you know, the Black folks, the other side of the coin, the Black folks who actually live where I live now in Roxbury and in, in um, what I call David Walker City. We call that David Walker City instead of Beantown. Um, they were getting stones and bricks thrown at them. It's something that you might've heard about called the busing um, forced uh, desegregation ruling in the mid seventies to later seventies. So um, the couple of professionals that the, the white society allowed to move into different strata of, of Massachusetts life um, was juxtaposed as a kind of a violent um, other side of the coin to what was going on where they were pitting the, um, the you know, the other folks in, in um, South Boston. I don't, I don't know how many folks here are familiar with, with the, the um, history of Boston, but it was it was a really interesting uh, growing up, but like I said, my extended family um, is in all parts in Carolinas, uh, Virginia, um, and my father's father basically Mac the name McCall comes from a slave owner in Prince George County, um, uh, right off of the um, the Chesapeake, which was tobacco land, and um, actually the jump off point for me turning genealogy into a part of my, my business came from some trips that I made down there to stay with family who used to tell me oral stories about the black folks and white folks who, who were kicked off of uh, land around in, in PG County that was called Camp Springs and, and this and that. And that's basically where the, um, the government came in and kicked them off and they put down an airport there. And that's where Air Force One lands all the time. Um, and then flies the, the so-called president, the orange baby over into a helicopter into the White House. Um, so I spent a lot of time down in that area sauntering out to the Annapolis, Maryland archives, trying to find information, um, talk, collecting um, oral history from my grandparents um, on my mother's side and my father's side and going into like Loudoun and Culpeper County and um, all the way down to Richmond um, and different trips. So, and you're gonna have to cut me off because I would talk all day about everything. <laughs> no, we're not cutting you off, but we do want to know. Now, in as far as your own genealogy, so you mentioned the parents, the grandparents, how far did you go? Well, um, in that, 
that PG County um, area, there was an old town that got burnt down in that war of 1812 called Nottingham. And these, <laughs> these white suckers over there, the, the, the slavers there, they had their plantations that came right down on the water. And that's how they shipped out their, their tobacco to, uh, to back all over the world and made their loot system happen. Well, um, the McCall, um, he was actually a dentist and owned eight slaves. But um, the, the furthest back that I've gone is to in the um, 1880 census, I have an ancestor, Sophia Maxell, who was 80 years old in relation to the head of household, who was my grandfather's grandfather. So that takes me basically back to 1801. And we know something important was happening in the world around 1801. Um, so it's just something to think about her um, in the time when the news of what was going on in the islands in Jamaica and Haiti, um, what her life was like enslaved um, in the plantation of uh, uh, Nottingham. And so um, by 1812 um, and 1830s and 40s, she's got her two sons and um, the, the British were really pissed with these, Mar the new, the, the baby Maryland, the new state of Maryland's um, plantation owners because they were stuffing junk into the barrels of the tobacco and trying to cheap them on the prices that got sent back. And, um, you know, so there was a lot going on when, when the British came back through there. And that's where um, you go down to Baltimore, they, where they had that, the, the Star Spangled Banner, which is the national anthem of the, the you know, which Colin Kaepernick and all of them is sitting down for. Um, the third verse in that is actually talking about my ancestors um, right in that, that, you know, cut right there, um, because they were not, they were not put, they were, they were being exposed to freedom. The first examples of freedom is, you know, these British soldiers in the American Revolution in the War of 1812 coming through and saying, hey, we might could have you on our side or something like that. Although that's not what they meant, but it created a kind of turbulence in that plantation life that made folks get that, you know, that straighter spine, you know? Um, but that that one document is the furthest back that I can go. Of course. Um, okay. Excuse me. Well, Let's yeah. leave the document aside. Let's do yeah. a more simple exercise. Okay. You are Joel McCall, mm -hmm. and your father is Aubrey and Tyrone McCall. Joel, I hope everyone is doing it for themselves. Okay. So yes, your father's name is. Aubrey Tyrone McCall. All right, and your mother? Brenda Joyce Pascal. Okay, and her parents? Her parents is um, Richard West and um, Jean Alma Powell. Okay, let's go to the father's side, his parents. Okay, Ruth, um, Ruth Huntley. Um, with Roanoke Roots and Francis, um, Francis Happy, that's my dad's dad, grandfather, his nickname was Happy uh, McCall. All right. So now here we had grandparents. We have four of them, all of us. Everyone that's following also have four grandparents, at least their names. Now, can we go up? To the grandparents' parents? Yeah. Okay, let's go, Brother Michael. Okay, well, it'd be easier if I had it laid out <laughs> in front of me. But <laughs> William, <laughs> William, no. Now, I'm thinking in my head that, mm -hmm. that it, 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 the fancy name of it is a pedigree chart. And you, you could put yourself on the side here and then go like this and then this, 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 or you can put yourself at the bottom 
at, at the bottom here and go uh, fathers, mothers, fathers, mothers, fathers, mothers, fathers, mothers. And if you go back just five generations, you got 64 different stories, depending on how much families were close <laughs> to each other back in the, in the time. Um, but you got 64 different stories to look at. And so if I'm here and I've got Francis and Francis uh, Happy McCall, his parents is Emma Jane uh, Smith and um, William Noble McCall, okay? And Emma Jane Smith was a beautiful black woman um, with Cherokee origins. And I haven't traced it yet, but down her line is, um, she comes from a McDaniel and there was a famous wrestler called Wahoo McDaniel um, with, with uh, native people um, lineage. And, and that's a part of that whole family. But um, no, I understand what you're doing, going back just the lineal. You, you don't have to focus so much on the uncles and aunts and cousins and all of that. Right. Um, but very important uh, practice what you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And it's important for each one of us to work on it. Doesn't matter how, you just do it what you got. But once you get started, you'll be surprised how far you can go. But until you get started, you just will go around saying, well, I don't know all my grandparents' names. I don't know the, you know, mm -mm. get started. Get the, the two parents, the four grandparents, and start to build. That will make you stronger. You will be a more solid person when you stand on that block. And by the way, I think all these charts are wrong. And my book, this business of putting me aside and then saying da 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 no, no good. Or putting me there and, uh, here and then putting everybody, my mother, my father, my grandparents, they cannot be on top of me. That's wrong. A proper genealogy tree should be designed in such a way that if I am here, my parents are, underneath me because these are these are my roots i'm already into my roots this is the trunk of the tree right that's me and then underneath me is mom and dad underneath them is their parents underneath them is the other parents above me are my children above them are my grandchildren above them are my great-grandchildren that's the way it should be but i've never used i've never found one and i keep asking people to make one for me and I haven't, I don't have one yet. So I know I'm saying it publicly. This thing is wrong. It does not take the reality into consideration. The, all the, 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 the design that exists are not really dealing with the family the way we, we know it. Okay. So uh, any person, designing person who's listening, please do propose a real um, family tree for me. Thank you very much. Because <laughs> I have to have one before January 1st. I must have one. And let's work on it. So yes, genealogy is important. Why? Why is it important? When you go to the doctor, if you come with a fairly important, uh, serious illness, doesn't the doctor ask you, is your mother alive? How did she die? Is your dad alive? What did he die of? Why? Are we thinking? They're looking for common, common diseases among exactly. the family. Yes, because a lot of things, everything is passed on to us. A lot is passed on to us. 
So in order to understand what you most likely will be affected by, if they know that your parents or grandparents had sugar or heart disease or that or the other, they already know what you're susceptible to have. So then when they're going to have tests, they already have pointers directing them. Okay? But more important, I, I don't have any um, heart problems, but I do take medicines for heart. Do you know why? My mom died, died suddenly. My dad died suddenly. My father was the healthiest man in the world. He was preparing a conference, and when his friend came to pick him up, they find him well-dressed with his conference in his hand on the ground. Never was sick, didn't go to no hospital, didn't have no problem. So I learned the lesson. So I take care of things that I, what we suspect happened to them, heart problem. So I take the raisins, I eat raisins, I take the raisin leaf tea, I take the things that I know, the um, flax seeds, those things that help with the heart because I already know what happened to my mom and dad. So I'm a high potential, even though I appear very, very healthy. <laughs> okay, so that's why the genealogy, it tells you, it helps you to prevent certain things. It helps you to, uh, to plan forward. Um, the, the Mayan people say, if you know 1,000 years of artistry, you can force for, foretell 1,000 years ahead. So if we know nothing about our own personal history, we don't know, uh, what's your grandmama's name? Mm, what did she do? Mm, you're a very weak person. Have to strengthen ourselves psychologically, in health-wise, in many, many ways. That's also why we are not properly prepared to run communities, much less countries. Because if we go by what Dessaline says, Dessaline says the nation is all those who went before us, all those who have yet to come, and us. So if I know nothing about those who went before me, I certainly cannot imagine the ones that are coming. So they are a very weak person where I stand. Okay? So genealogy is extremely important. And you'll see all the dominating, dominating countries. You see that when their heads of state speak, they always pull some ex head of state and put in the, when it's important, they'll always name some other folks from the past. When our people talk, it's me, me, me. <laughs> so that's a very weak stand. But let's go on, genealogy. So knowing who came before you on the family, on the bloodline, on the psychological line, on the, uh, I was recently talking to a young lady who was worried because she was, she became pregnant, she's 45, and doctors told her this, that, and the other. I said, well, don't worry about it. My grandmother, we married at 58 to a 96 year old man. And two years later, she was sick. Doctors said she had cancer. That's on the paternal side. Doctors said she had cancer and started to give her medicine, blah, blah, and then decided for surgery. The woman was just pregnant. He was 59. And I know many of us who have the babies at 45, 50, 52, 54. So please don't take these people's stuff all in your head. Learn about your own family and you will know a lot. And that will be your best guide. Those are important. 
So, Brother Marco, let's go back to, I've seen, uh, did you prepare anything for us? Uh, yeah, I have a slide deck of the workshop that I that I run uh, with some basic ideas of a basic roadmap, if you, yeah. So, Brother does a lot of um, workshops, and he's going to give us an idea as to how he does about doing what he does. Okay, I'm going to try to share this here. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay. Can you folks see that? Yes, sir. I see. Tracing our roots roadmap. There you go. So, um, what you just mentioned, Marbello, is is one of the things that I realized once I moved into the education uh, phase of my my um, career, and I began to do public history projects and and teach genealogy. Um, I've realized in Boston that a lot of our young people feel like they fell out of the sky. And so they can't, they can't actually um, have a context for even talking about just their parents or their grandparents. So I tried to kind of um, make a method that would help me deliver quick um, workshops um, to groups, you know, uh, under 20 or so. And I try to, um, design them so that they're free to, for the community, um, but they, they also had enough to do their own work. And um, so once I set up the classes, did some flyers and, and worked with the community centers in different um, places to teach, uh, you know, people would come, I, I'd usually get a lot of uh, elders too, a lot of aunties who would come in, they'd look me up and down, not believing that I, you know, Dread Brother, he's teaching his class. And then, um, you know, they, they'd be that person in their family who was really, really, they had the why in them, which was fantastic. Um, but it was, I tried to design something so that they could turn around and get those young folks, the younger generations in the family who wasn't um, as, as interested. And so I broke it in, I cut, first of all, I called the program Ancobia 6. And Ancobia is from the tree language, meaning um, those who um, lead in courage and commitment. Uh, so instead of calling it like a hero's um, or shiro's kind of thing, I tried to use an African word to describe what it takes and, and to build on that why. So the six steps of basic genealogy um, that I designed was uh, first, you have to ask why roots. So that's Ancobia one. And that's some of the stuff that we already just talked about. The next very important step is autobiography. And actually, Marbella, you touched on that also about how starting with you and then going back prevents people from knocking you off your block. Because as you go to do research, no matter what way it might be, whether it's in pottery, DNA, um, storytelling, any kind of deep ancestry research you're trying to do, the more that you collect about what you know, starting with you and your family, and then going back, the more powerful your decision will be of, oh, yeah, that is my people over here, or I, I think I'm going down the wrong road. So it's a lot of detective work. So I spend a whole, a whole session on autobiography, and that can include looking at your birth certificate more closely, if you're finding your birth certificate if you don't have one, um, you know, trying to go through some exercises to think about where did your name come from? You know, um, Joel is a Hebrew-based name. McCall is an Irish-Scottish name. Um, where do these names come from? Um, you know, nicknames, different things like that. The next section that we go to is focusing on the elders. So that's your parents and your grandparents. And for some of us who don't have, um, you know, parents who are still uh, with us, they've made their transition already, it's important to try to connect with people who might've grown up with them and known about the context of their life and where they, they live. There's a lot of different ways and a lot of little 
uh, tricks you know you can you can do to to begin an interview process. And by interview, I I take the folks in the class and I say this is not about um, okay where were you born and going through a list of thirty different things. A lot of our grandparents and our parents don't want to talk about these times because there's a lot of trauma that that's involved with. Um, you know, well, growing up in Babylon, growing up in a in a um, in today's um, modern world, and so there are different ways of going about trying to get story and then triangulating back, asking Dr. Google, you know, okay, this is where my grandmother first went to school, or where she first grew up, or she first worked on a uh, on on uh, or. Um, where my grandfather's tobacco farm actually was, um, or where um, these ancestors were working and so forth. So there's a different ways to find information like that, but we do a couple of basic things like that. The next section that I, I kind of broke down that I saw is really, really important is uh, I call Sasha and Zamani. And Sasha uh, refers, to, again, they're twee, twee uh, language words, Sasha, from what I understand, is a word that represents those ancestors in living mem memory. Um, and so your grandmother might talk to you about her mother, and that's someone who's still in living memory. And you can collect a lot of information and organize a lot of research about finding that stuff out. Zamani are those folks who are uh, beyond living memory. Um, you might come to a, a census from 1900 and it's uh, a uncle who was you didn't even know exist um so that that's somebody who's beyond living memory of of you know the story that you know about and that's just going further back um and the last piece of uh the 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 next piece is deeper ancestry and that can that can involve um you know trying to find out um, you know, what farm or how did your people basically come to be a part of this Atlantic world, assuming that um, you're connected with Africa. Um, and so the, the goal is to end the workshop with a, a Descendants Day lecture where you can sing, a po sing uh, say a poem, dance, perform in some way um, and express what the trod, whether in the workshop or just in your own family uh, research, um, share that with as an in-gathering with the with the group. So I have people, we come and we dress up um, and we bring, you know, significant others and, and children and, and parents. Um, and I've had some incredible, um, you know, sharing, sharing situations. So that's kind of the, the, um, like the the harder uh, path or agenda, but the um, the design the design um, is just what you said. It, you know the why the autobiography the elders the Sasha and Zamani as our roots Africa I belong and bearing tradition making sure we continue this storytelling uh, going forward um, and these things will continue to affect you. Um, you can find stuff out about your great grandparents that you see in your child. Um, you can learn things in your DNA ancestry, just like my Bella was just saying, that can affect your decisions um, in, in how you treat your own nutrition and different things like that. But the idea of the program was to create a few steps and go towards a goal with the understanding that this is a lifelong process. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up. Uh, before we go any further, I have to do my FF duties. Thank you, Franz. Right. So as you know, our purpose in life is to build Fondation Marie-Claire Rose Felicité Bonheur des Salines in IT. To do all that we can so we can have an institution here that 
does research and produce material that help our people to build their own identity. Without identity, we do not exist, really. So we have to work at building it daily against all odds. So Fondation Felicité on Facebook, you have uh, on Twitter, F slash, not slash, what is this thing? I don't know. Felicité1804. Uh, on Instagram is Fondation, what is it called? Is that a dash? Is that called a dash too? When it's below the letters? The un underscore. Underscore, thank you. All right, so it's Fondation underscore Felicité. And um, Official by Inabello on YouTube. It's official, the Official by Inabello YouTube channel. On WhatsApp, you can contact us with, with this number, 509-2940-0869. And uh, our website is www.fondationfelicite.com. And if you want to help us and contribute, you can donate on PayPal with Fondation Felicité at Gmail, uh, uh, pour Fondation Felicité at gmail.com. So those are the ways to stay in touch with Fondation Felicité and help us to advance the work. Just as we move from there, um, hmm. all right. Uh, I will soon be joining you guys on the other side of the ocean. And on November, on November 7th, from 2 to 7, our Akebulan STEM Education Center, Aina Bello, IT's Women, will be uh, talking about IT's Women uh, in the revolution. So we look forward to seeing many of you on Saturday, November 7th. Um, they purposely hide, yes, you're, okay. So I'm sure France will send you guys the, uh, the flyer so you can have the information. Those who can make it, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Now, I would like for us to take a look. We haven't looked at that, um, that man with his marked back in a while. We haven't lo looked at it. Yes. Uh, it's important that we remember that this was common, that they would do this to any of us, men, women, children, whatever. And, uh, and this is for life. It doesn't go away. Once you get that kind of warp on your back, uh, you die with it. But imagine trying to lay on your back for a while. You want to rest. I have this exercise that I'm doing these, these days. Uh, where I, have to, I lean on my back and put my feet up. How could I do this? And you know, Jean-Jacques Dessalines' back was like that. That didn't stop the man from going all the way and doing what he had to do to whip British Army, Spanish Army, and French Army in order to create IT. So compared to these people, look at yourself and count your blessings. Stop complaining. Count your blessings. It will make it will make you stronger. Thank you, France. Is there some? Oh, we also have our book, Jean Jacques Dessalines, 21 points qu'on a sous la ville. That's the French edition. That's available on Amazon now. Uh, we hope many of you will purchase it, and. Uh, help us to do the work that we have to do over here. All right, and Thoroughbred Books is, uh, is France, comp France company, and that's the company that, has, that we do a lot of work with. One of them is publishing Heroes of the Asian Revolution, 
The Philbright Books also offers IT, Macondal, and Bookman. France is the author to those three books. Baina is the author to She Rose. And you can order them through Thoroughbred Books. Also, I would like to mention, I don't have a slide for it, um, but uh, Independent Scoop Drive is among us, right? January 1st, the very important work of Fondation Felicité, providing independent soup, some call, know it as Soup Jumu, uh, to all across the country in IET. Um, it's very important work. They've been doing this work for like over 20 years at least. So uh, we want to make sure, even though, you know, the way the economy is right now with all this, you know, chaos, um, right now it's time for us to step up and help out uh, with the distribution of the soup. You want this year to be the biggest year yet. Um, we have a lot of territories we have to go to. So uh, the only way that will happen is through uh, a group effort. The collective must come together and um, you know, sacrifice to make this work happen. So uh, again, you could use that same um, donation, PayPal donation, poufondesonfelicite at gmail.com if you would like to uh, help with the uh, independent soup distribution. Thank you. Thank you, Flux, and thank you to all those who will help. What I will add on this is that what we do is um, October, November, December, we do the fundraising. We try to raise as much as we can. And whatever we raise, we prepare, we have, we organize for groups to come and learn how to prepare a healthy soup, a very healthy soup. And then it is shared on January 1st uh, on different areas of the of the country so we look forward to and this year is going to is it's going to be great it's going to you know 2021 you can't beat it it has to be great all right very good well we are at 2 p.m 205 p.m so that would send us to the next portion of our program, which is the Q&A session. Uh, I want to thank Brother Joel McCall for the great information. Uh, ancestry, um, trying to find your roots. I know a lot of us on this webinar right now have maybe started the process but haven't finished it. Um, but I agree, it's one of the most important things that we can do. Um, I've actually started on my own. I've got I haven't gotten very far, but um, I've gotten to my grandparents' grandparents. So that's, um, that's good for me, <laughs> but I'm continuing to do the work. Um, and I have their, all their names on my refrigerator. It was actually my children's project so that they can see the names every day, right? And, and be familiar with them. Uh, yes. That makes me think of how upside down our world is today. I grew up with all my grandparents right next door. So, you know, I didn't have to go find out who they are. They were, and they were part of my life in everything that I did. Uh, I, my paternal grandfather was somebody who sent his mule every Saturday to each of his children's house to bring the food for the week. <laughs> He went to his garden, collected stuff, and sent food for us. He owned a store and school that all the, 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 the meters of uh, cloth we needed for uniforms came to us. So, and also I did get to know great grandparents, some of the great grandparents and aunts uh, or sisters of great grandparents. Um, so, Today, we have to go search for who they were. Something is very wrong with that picture, but it's best to do it than not. 
you should walk around knowing at least the four grandparents and the eight great grandparents. That's the minimum we should walk around in our pockets, have it, you know, soon as somebody say their name, oh, my grandfather's name was that. My great grand, oh, yeah, you never done this. Yes. And that will make us much stronger. Thank you. Absolutely. I agree 100%. So thank you. It's a very important work you're doing, uh, Brother Joel, uh, yeah. helping others get in connect, uh, connect with their roots. So uh, with that being said, um, for those who are interested in asking Brother Joel uh, McCall with uh, asking questions uh, of the Brother Joel McCall or for Ms. Pro Professor Bayana Bello, you could go ahead and raise your hand um, in the participants screen. I see we have a hand raised already, but if you can go ahead, raise your hand on there, then that way you could be in the queue if you have any questions about uh, your own journey of, you know, finding out your, your ancestry, your lineage, you know, right now is actually a great opportunity uh, to ask someone who actually does this for a living. So, um, all right, let's go ahead with the, the first question from Marlene. Marlene, go ahead and unmute yourself, ask your question, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Marlene. Good afternoon, um, Brother Joel. My question um, is actually about um, the genealogy. You know, um, as you were talk th talking, and I'm I'm thinking in my head, and I'm like, now realize I can't go any further than actually my maternal grandparent, my maternal grandparents. Right? I can't even do the paternal. And you know, one of the reasons why is in Haiti also, you know, we don't really rely on documentation such as birth certificate. It's a lot of word of mouth. Um, you know, you listen to the elders talking, you know, who's your dad? Uh, and sometimes because of the out of wedlock situation, like if you were born out of wedlock, then it's like, well, you know, they don't really want to talk about it. You may hear somebody says, boy, well, yeah, that's so-and-so's father. That was so-and-so's uncle. And, <laughs> and you're like, okay. So it's pretty difficult. And I've thought about this and I've thought about, well, sh should I go back or should I just, because I, I don't think I can go back, really. I've tried on my paternal side. Um, so I understand the point that it's important and I get it, but where, where, how can we make peace with ourselves if we absolutely cannot find this information? So that's a really good question, uh, Marlene. And it's, it gets to the heart of it really is that you have to go back because your ancestors are waiting for you to discover them. Your, your, do you have any children? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I, I know it's controversial, but I'm going to use one example of uh, DNA. So in one of my classes, a young sister, um, ended up doing the DNA test and all of this. And she found that her, her pappy had a, had a other whole family and they ended up on the other side of the United States. And she had the courage to all of a sudden, um, you know, reach out and connect. And she found that she had more in common with a younger brother that she got to connect with out of the blue than she had with her own siblings you know he was he was outspoken and she was outspoken he he was artistic and creative and she was too and so there are all types of discoveries by the trod okay it's it's um that's why i spend the whole first class um talking about the why because you could say i get it i get it but you don't really get it get it until in the trod you start to be influenced by these forces that you can't anticipate okay i'll give you two examples 
I did a DNA test um, really before Ancestry.com and all this got started, but it, it traced my Y lineage, my father's, 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 father's people. Now, if you go back far enough in the DNA, you're looking at, you know, 14, 15, even 20 generations in the past. So you're talking about one minuscule of something that was you, right? But as folks as a part of this Atlantic and Pacific, the Ma'afa world, that connection is powerful. And I'll use the example of myself. This was 2004 or so that I got the, the, the word back from this DNA company. And they said, it's a, it's a certificate. And I, I had a little camera and I recorded myself. I still have the video. I was living alone at the time and I've danced up and down when I opened up the thing. It said, you belong to the Bamileke people in the, in the you know, Southwestern Cameroon. And I was, I was uh, my whole heart lifted. That's freedom for a moment. That's that peace and it's completely unexpected. Now, yes, yeah, a tiny little piece of uh, uh, science that's saying that, you know, way back, I shared some part of my makeup with a collective group of people in Cameroon. But then my first question is what they call God. What did they, uh, what, what language do they speak? Where's Bamaleke people come from? And then I'm tied into the Green Sahara. And if I find out to come, they said with well, the first Google searches that I found was, you know, Bamaleke people is the Jewish people of the part of Cameroon. And what's Cameroon? Well, that comes from Camarao, which is shrimp because the Portuguese got down there and messed up and called it something. And then I come to find out, this is 2004. I, I start researching and I come to find out, well, you know, in Cameroon, they had somebody over there to dic dictate it for, for 20 years or some, and the Anglophone Cameroonese Africans is mad at the Francophone Cameroonese. So we got our own drama over there while I'm here in Boston and, you know, this Negro over here from this project hate me because I live over here. And all these connections start to happen that you don't anticipate. So what happened next? I'm introverted, I'm shy, but I'm like, I got to connect with some Cameroon people. I, I'm, I'm Cameroonian, right? Two years later, I get up the courage and I look up a Cameroon association. Turns out they're in a, a suburb of Boston in a little city called Lowell. And I call them up and I say, you know, I did a DNA test and, you know, it linked me to these people here. And I was wondering if I could sit in on one of your meetings or something. So I talked to somebody who became my friend and they invited me out and the first thing they invited me out to was a funeral in a, in, a, in a Massachusetts church full of African people. It was a brother of theirs who got killed in a uh, bicycle accident or something, left behind a family. And that was the context with which I was introduced to a group of people. I would become a secretary, the secretary of the nonprofit organization. It's a small group of 14 African families that got introduced to an African-American with all of my baggage and all of my excellence and all of my story that got exposed to them and how they dealt with stuff. And, you know, middle-class professional working Africans out in this suburb of Massachusetts, in that whole trod in my relationship with them, I developed a, a kinship with this, these families. And that was all off of this research you know, just seeking the family in the first place. And so I got to meet a fawn, the F-O-N, which is the, the fawn of Mancon, which is the region of um, uh, eastern, uh, western grasslands of Cameroon. And so I, I learned how, what's, how you approach someone who is of royalty in Africa. He came to Worcester in the middle of Massachusetts. His family was out here. And I got a context to meet African royalty, who's one of the last indigenous rulers who was educated in Nigeria. And we were talking to each other at the eve of Obama coming, uh, uh, Obama's uh, election. So I, I don't know if you can tell from my passion, but you've got to go. Don't tell me you can't 
So if you can't go past your paternal and all that, what you started to do by listening in on somebody saying, oh, but you, you, you know, you got a secret family over here. Don't jump down their throat. There's a little, you got to have tact and you got to have um, balance in how you approach, but you can get it out of them. Take them aside next time. And if it's like an old auntie who's slipping stuff, old, old juice, uh, uh, juice about the, the the family you know cook something for or, or or you know make a project of it and then the things will come and like i said you can triangulate after you got to be detective about it but you got to listen too and listen closely and then sometimes you got to be direct and ask hard questions you know you don't know what your parent or your your grandparent or your your family member will reveal and maybe they've been waiting excuse me, for an excuse to get something off their chest too. A lot of people on their deathbed is going to be saying the, the, the whole dirt of the family, you know, but I, when I'm doing these workshops, that's really the first thing that people say is I can't, I can't, I can't. And I encourage people don't go that way. Start out with the, I can and keep with it and take a break. Take yes. a break. If, if you going down one line and you hit a wall, that's okay. In 10 years, they're going to have some new technology that you can, you know, sneeze in a cup and it's going to tell you everything about everything, you know, and, and, and don't overlook the, the, uh, the things that you see in your children and the things that you see in yourself, you know, uh, that autobiography piece is a huge part. Start with that. And, and, and the goal is everybody write their own memoir, you know, and and go from there so i'm sorry to spend so much time but that's a real important question that you asked and i and i hope i you know i hope you you keep with it and don't give up you absolutely won't. thank thank you just one more comment i want to make um as um professor bellow was talking about the um the medical history and um so that was a good thing that you said, Professor Bello, that, you know, we, we're not going to know sometimes exactly what the history were because, you know, they weren't doing diagnostic testing on some of these folks. So it's good that you look back, especially us Haitians, and figure out, well, what, you know, how old the person was when they died and what was the situation? Were they chronically ill or did they suddenly die? Because then you have an idea because... We, we, we tend to think, you know, everybody was killed some, in some mysterious way, but we know that they had to have some sort of medical illnesses too. So that's what I do when I go to a doctor and the doctor says, well, what are your, fam uh, your family history? And sometimes out this, do you have cancer in your family? And I'll outright, I'll say, I don't know, but I do know I had an aunt who died at 50, one, I had this other person who died suddenly in their thirties or forties just to give him a, um, you know, uh, context, what, what they need to look for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Marlene. Thanks for your question. And thanks for the answer, Joel. That was good. All right. Next question comes from Fritz Gerald. Fritz Gerald Bontemps. Go ahead, uh, Fritz Jowell, you could unmute and ask your question, please. Uh, yes, yes, my question is, I have one question for Joel Macau, and I have another question for Baina Bello. So the question I have for um, Joel is, all right, um, speaking of, speaking of um, ancest ancestry, right? Now, um, when I analyze countries such as Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, right? We have Costa Rica, like all the Spanish countries in the Caribbean. Now, they have, they have slavery. Slavery existed in them, right? But when I interact with these people, these people say that they're not black. These people say that they're not black, right? And then these people are even racist against black people. So. My question about that, right? Um, first of all, why are why are what made these people have like a lighter skin complexion? And not only that, too, like what made them even racist? 
compared to places like Jamaica, Haiti, and like um and other like black countries. And my question for Baina Bello is um the more I do research on Haitian voodoo, right? People like now there's something new that Haitians are telling me. They saying that part of Haitian voodoo, part of Haitian voodoo didn't come from Africa. Part of it, part of the Haitian voodoo tradition came from the Native Americans who lived in Haiti. But when you look at the when you look at the Haitians, they look like they look like spitting version of Africans. So that's confusing. So that that's confusing. Like if if part of it came from the Native Americans, right? If part of it came from the Native Americans, like um, why are why are ninety five percent of them black? Why is ninety five percent of the population black? Thank you. We understand your question. Uh, go ahead, brother Michael, please. Okay, so brother, uh, I'm sorry, your name Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, uh, um, Fitzgerald or Fitzgerald? Fitzgerald, yeah. So it's important what you ask, brother, and it's a it's a it's a big question. One of the things that I used to teach um, and been doing it for years. I think the original video came out in 2007, but it's a wonderful teaching tool. And it's a different, difficult thing you want to do because you want to have a quick answer um, to, to, to understand the colorism and the, and the, and the um, internal hatred that's, that's built and designed in our people throughout the islands, throughout the, the South of America and the Northern city, the urban cities in the world, really. Um, you go to Africa and the first billboard you see is um, something for light skin, whatever. The tool that I use is something I, I wish I could flip the share the screen and show you a, a slide that I've made. And I can if you reach out to me after I'll, I'll share my deets. Um, it's a it's a video called A Girl Like Me. If you go to YouTube and look up that that uh, video, it's a remarkable uh, video done by a young sister in a community center in in the Bronx of Brooklyn in 2007. And she recreates the Brown versus Board of Education um, decision where um, a, a black couple who were psychologists were explaining the damage of psych the psychology of segregated schools. And they did a doll test. I think if you Google the doll test video, it'll come up as well. But there's one particular young girl, six or seven years old in the video. And I always slow the video down and, and show it to people that I talk with. I even showed this inside of a prison here. And everywhere I go, I get a visceral response. Because when the, one, the, the young sister does the doll test, she says, she push, she says, um, what is, she puts a white doll in front of this young black child and says, um, what, it, what do you think of this doll? And she says, good. Then she puts the black doll in front of the child and says, what do you think of this doll? And the young child, 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 says, bad. Okay. And then um, she, she pushes them forward. I, I, I'm mixing it up. She pushes it forward and says, um, which one is more like you? And then she, she leaves the two on the table so she can make the choice. And she asks, which is called a girl like me. So she says, which one, which one is more like you? Now, she just defined the white doll as, as good and the black doll is bad. And when I slow the video down, you can see this child, the violence that happens on her brain. Okay. She ain't even been out of her house or wherever, but through her parents, through her school, through their society, through the whole society. She's taken on in her brain a great violence that you can see she doesn't know what to choose. She reaches for the good because she's a child of God, right? And then she reaches and pushes forward the black doll. She's accepted, internalized that there is a great, great defect on her soul, on herself. 
She's accepted nigger. Now, does she start out that way? No. She knows who she is, but she's fighting against it the whole way. All right? But that idea is what makes it easy for this child, for example, to grow up hating herself, to make bad decisions, to suicide herself, or if she sees her sisters or brothers out there, commit violence on them as well from this coercion, from this captivity that's been brought on to her. That's homicide. And then those of them who rise up, who, who, who become the, the powerful in this society, which says power over instead of power with, which is an older African idea, they help to create genocide. So you got your African uh, leading blacks, not black leaders, but you've got those type of people who can create this violence of hate on themselves that's all born from that same source. Okay, so that's a long way to get around it. And sometimes you need a device like that to show people the thing, but there's, there's rarely a quick, easy way to, to explain that. But don't lose track young brother that's what is at the core of these people who who will do all type of gymnastics to say they're not black they'll even go as far to say that um they're native and they have nothing to do with africa you know there's a whole bunch of uh young folks who who although we share ancestry the the, the they'll do all types of crazy backflips um to disassociate with Africa. And you can see the training of what that is. There's no way, just like Brother Amos Wilson says, there's no way that the minority of European and those in power can keep power over the, the black masses of the whole planet, the majority that we are, unless you have a delusion or you're eluded in some way. So to connect them back to that reality, that's what you got to do. And, and don't stop. You know, it's, it's, it's not easy to articulate it, but work at those words and those tools and examples you can use to show the people that, that matter, that you care. Some people you ain't gonna reach. So some people, you ain't gonna convince them that, that they are part, you know? Um, so I've said too much. Yeah, and no, I understand, I understand. I understand uh, like, mm -hmm. some like, um, even, um, even in my culture, right? Um, some people I tell them I'm gonna change that I'm gonna change my name. They tell me that like because all Haitians, if not all, most Haitians have French names. But some 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 of them I told them I'm gonna change my name. They tell that you are out of your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they tell me. Yep, and and you know uh, a young man who who grew up he spent uh, a few years here and a lot of his summers. Um, just two blocks from where I'm sitting is uh, he dealt with that in a really important um, interview. You catch him in Babylon Media. Uh, his name was Malcolm Little at the time, but something that the nation did and they confronted directly. They say we use the X to remind ourselves um, that, uh, of this uh, connection and what this means. And so um, there are reasons that I hold on to McCall, but at the same time, I'm always reaching for those new languages and those new words to articulate exactly what you, your impulse to, I want to change my name. I don't want to uh, represent as this. And that's a great step. That's, that shows you're on the trod, you know, you're on the trod on the journey, you know. Definitely. Uh, Baina. Oh. Yeah, we lost Baina. Yeah, I'm just, I just realized that Professor Bello is not on here. She must have dropped out. Uh, she'll be back. She'll be back shortly. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. She, I think her connection dropped out. But uh, she'll definitely be back shortly to, to answer your question. Sometimes she drops out and then she comes right back on, like within a minute or so. All 
All right, and I have a few people in the queue. I have Wahid Abdullah, I have Nayasha, I have Kayla, I have Wajit. So uh, everybody hold tight and we are going to uh, continue the conversation very quickly. Um, what I'll do, Brother Fitzgerald, I'll, um, while we're waiting on Professor Bello to answer that other part of your question, because I think that's a, an important question also. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but, so we're gonna hold off on that until Professor Bello comes back. But we're gonna go to the next question to see if someone has a question for um, Brother Joel, all right? And then we're gonna come back to you once Professor Bello comes back. Not a problem. All right, cool, thank you. Okay, so Wahid, Wahid, if you have um, a question for Brother Joel McCall, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask a question, please. Wahid Abdullah. Oh, you're on mute, brother. I'm good? Yeah, there you go. All right, peace and blessing, family. Uh, good to hear and see you. Uh, I have two questions. One is for Mama Bello, but I do have a question for Brother Joel, and he kind of answered it because the brother is very thorough and very precise. He covers a lot of territory and a lot of miles. He did address one, and that was what validity or how much stock does he put in some of these ancestry uh, search engines like you know ancestry.com, and he seemed like he uh, supports that. Do, is that true? You support some of these uh, search engines? Yes, I, I do, Brother Wahid. And, and the, the interesting thing is, is that it's not the only tool. That's the key thing to keep in mind. Um, right. There are so many different paths that the ancestors are going to make themselves available to you. But I would okay. say don't, don't, don't close the door on none of them, you know, because you could you, you find, I, uh, we were talking about Kunta Kinte earlier today, and um, I was in the, the, this is in 2003 or four, I was in the Maryland State Archives in Annapolis, Maryland, and I found my grandfather's grandfather was in the U.S. Colored Troops, so he was in Lincoln's Army uh, when they were coming down through uh, to go fight in the South, and when I found my grandfather's grandfather's muster out roll, that's the, the document that said, James Maxwell has um, left the Civil War army or whatever. I'm, I'm in a quiet library, a big archive hall, and I wanted to jump up and scream, you know, like, yo, <laughs> I got this right here. So don't, don't close the door on no stuff that the, you know, the, the, the Mormon church and all them put all the stuff online and some of the tools you got is behind a paywall and some of it is worth investing in because it saves you some time and you can find some powerful, powerful documents. So, so um, I, I don't think it's so much as a thing as believe in it or not, it's use every tool that you can to try to find where the ancestors are trying to make themselves known to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Thanks, man. All right, so we have Professor Bello back. So we can go back to the second part of uh, Brother Fitzgerald's question, and then we'll come back to you, Wahid, for, for your question, all right? Okay, it was about racism? No, 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 no. The second part about my question was about like, um, in the Haitian voodoo, this new thing, coming out where they talking All about right. uh, okay okay i remember thank it's you um, yes uh, it's not a new thing it's a fact all right now Asian culture just like most cultures on all of uh, the spaces on the americas so the so-called americas it's a space where you have the first people that were there the aborigines and then you have the slavers, they came and imposed whatever they imposed. And then when they finished slaughtering the, the, the Aborigines, they went back to Africa to bring Africans there. But they did not erase the people that were there first. And they did not and could not and could never, even if they like to pretend that they do, 
they cannot erase the cultures that were there. So you do have, as when you say you Aishan, you do have a culture that has portions of African culture, portions of Aborigines culture, portions of Euro-Christian domination. So you have all three elements in what you call your culture. And I will repeat, portions of Aborigines culture, portions of African culture, and portions of Euro-Christian domination. Every time you see yourself not wanting to hear what the other person is doing or saying, remember, you are being a Euro-Christian dominator. That's where you got it from. Because in Africa, we sat down for days and talk it out to find a solution. Among the Arawak, the Taino, the Sibonese, they could sit for moons talking it out to find the solution. Only one element is not about talking nothing out with nobody. It's about domination and domineering. And they, you've been in their presence for all these years. They've been imposing their ways on you. So, yes, it's right there. Their racism, their prejudice, their just in unjust behavior, all of it is part of you. You've went to their schools. You've gone to their church. All the quotes, you quote them. So we have to be conscious. They are present in us. Now, if we want to take specific things about voodoo, generally, most of what we call veve are from the Aborigines culture. It's not from the African culture. Our songs, our dance, our various, uh, the dresses, all of that is from Africa. But the vevers are mostly from the Arawak Taino people. So, and it's nothing new, it always has been. No people is erased from the face, no culture is erased from the face of the earth. They always transform, transpose, go into something else. There are th certain ways that we say certain things, it's a mixture of Arawak and Taino, um, Arawak and Africans, okay? So, but all three live in us. And if there's one of them we don't want, we have to be conscious and remove it from us. But it's there when, you don't, when you're not aware of it, it's right there acting on you. Got so in, in everywhere, that's, yeah, you have the three mixed. Got it, understood. All right, no. thank you, Chris Gerald, for your question. Uh, and thank you, Professor, for the answer. Okay, uh, next you. question is from Wahid, Brother Wahid, the second part of your question, please. Yeah, uh, peace and greetings, uh, Mama Bello. Uh, peace and greetings. Yes, my question to you is, is, is kind of twofold. One is, well, one is, a, is, is a, actually a statement. Uh, we're looking forward next week to being in Florida to meet and greet you for the first time. Uh, right. that. So, so that's going to be the highlight of 2020 for us. <laughs> uh, Thank the, you. Uh, the, the question is, it seems like, and maybe you can help me with this, the millennials, uh, it seems like it's a, it's a orchestrated and uh, a, a, a push for integration for blacks and whites for the children uh, to marry. So what would that do to a Pan-African movement? Because it seems like it's, it's orchestrated and it's really concentrated too because they're pushing that. Okay. Here's how I look at all these. This is not the first orchestrated mm -hmm. attack complo, whatever you want to call it. They are forever doing this. Mm -hmm. Slavery is an orchestrated uh, structure to get us away from ourselves and ultimately to destroy us. But in spite of everything, we are still here. Mm -hmm. So one more orchestration well, fine. 
Let them orchestrate the only thing they know how to orchestrate, which is the structure. And let us be more serious and mindful and conscious about building ourselves, strengthening ourselves, and making ourselves more and more powerful. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Brother Wahid. Now yes. let's move on to the next question. We have um, Nayasha. Nayasha, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Hello. How are you? Can and can everybody hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Okay. Hello, Mama Bello, and hello, Baba Marco. Right? Did I pronounce the name properly? Yes, it's McCall, young sister. You McCall. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, my first question is on Baba McCall. Um, uh, if my ancestor had some debt, um, debt um, how kind of effect have this on me? And um, how to break generational um, uh, generational um, causes? And the next question was on Mama Bello. It was um, like uh, um, I'm trying to understand uh, my culture, and uh, uh, um, and um, when I listen to elders speaking about my culture, it triggers me a lot of times because I see a lot of I think I see a lot of sexism. This is what I think. When they are together and they're talking about um, Zimbabwe and South African culture, like um, it is a woman's position to give up her, her name of her family than to, to, to take the name of her husband. Like how do I deal with, um, I don't want to disrespect our elders, I know that I have, I know that I have experience that I can learn from, I can grow from. But how can I find a way to um, to deal with them, and also to work with them? Like they talk about uh, why women should accept polygamy, and uh, they talk about also about like there was a situation where they were talking about single mothers. And um, our elders, King uh, Bongane, he's also a king, and about traditional culture, and he said, um, those women who have three children from different men are dirty. And when I hear that word, something inside of me just, just crumbled. Um, yes, yes, they say it in this, it is a woman's womb. There are so many different spirits of different men. So, okay, to make it short, I want to take so much time. We have other people who have questions. So, um, and how can I um, acknowledge myself about spirituality and um, to understand our elders more when they, are, when they speak? So I hope I was um, short enough and I could pronounce my question in the proper way. Okay. Thank you yeah. for your questions. And I believe they were pretty clear to all of us. Okay. Okay. Brother Joel, do you want to respond? You, you go ahead and start. You, you all right. Go ahead and start. Fine. Okay. The first thing that we'll say. The basic of basis of life is time, space, action. Mm -hmm. Our actions are what mark our life. What we do in life is by our actions. In time, on space. So, depending on your age, you are marked by a specific time, space. All right. I'm 72. There are things that I will not tolerate. I don't care who does it, who says it, because I come from a different time space and I have a different way of looking at things. Um, 
for example, when you mentioned, you know, well, having children from so many fathers, I don't see why I would want to defend that. Uh, what is the interest? Okay, what is the purpose of community? Are we here to just do what we want to do? Or are we here to do something that take us all somewhere? Okay, so um, when you have, you mention names, in most African tradition, women did not take the man's name. That came with your Christian practices. But some people, that's all they know. They don't know what used to be before. So they are attached to whatever the Euro Christian has given them. Just like some of us will be attached to Jesus, to a white Jesus and a white Mary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because that's what they've grown up with. But they forget before all of this. If we take, for example, South Africa, Shaka Zulu, the law of war among the Zulus, up until the 1800s, you do not kill people. They fight with um, what you throw, uh, what is it called? Lance in French. What is it in English? Spear. 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 Thank you. Spear. Spear. Spear, thank you. You fight with a spear, so you always aim below the abdomen. So you aim for the thighs or legs but you do not aim to kill people. But once the uh, Shaka Zulu saw how the Euro Christians were slaughtering his people, he changed the law and now they started doing just like everybody else. Hey, it's about taking the life and that's what they do. So if we are not uh, informed enough you know, I see many texts saying about, oh, how the Zulus are so mean, they were blah, blah, they did this, that. That, <laughs> who is writing? We have to be careful. So all of this to say what? Every information that we have, we need to find out, we need to do its genealogy. When did it come into our lives? Where did it come from? then we will have a better base for determining our position on this particular thing. Polygamy, as far as I'm concerned, I lived about 15 years in Africa. Polygamy is a structure that aims for men to be just and women to know how to share. And among the Hausa people, where I lived, the man had almost nothing to say about who would be his second wife or third wife and how, who he goes to. No, that's the job of the first wife. And it's usually the first wife who would say, listen, because now we have a business in the North, a business in the South, we have this, we have that. We cannot, I want you to have, I want our home needs a second wife. She will demand it. And often she will pick it. I know of a, a friend of mine, when she wanted her husband to have a second wife, she wanted the husband to have a young second wife because she hates to travel. And the husband has to take the plane and travel left and right. Says, if you have a second wife, she'll be young enough. She'll be, she like traveling. She'll like all these things. I don't like to go to Europe and all. You will have somebody to do this with you. And that's exactly what the husband had to have as a second wife. She chose it. So it's not marriage in the African culture was not a thing of what you look like. It wasn't a sex deal. It was a community affair. So the purpose of a polygamous marriage or polyandrous marriage where women had several husbands, the purpose is different from what people marry for today. Okay. So today there's like a confusion. We're sort of doing a modern marriage. We're taking the ancient ways and putting them in a modern con con uh, uh, context. So things are not working out that well. 
because we're not looking at the essence of what we do. Okay, so what I would advise you, try to learn more about the tradition, but not just what to do, but the whys they do it. When you understand the why, you are in a better position, in a better place to choose your position on that. On that. But also know that, hey, elders will have a position that's not yours. And you can respectfully disagree. <laughs> Nothing says you have to agree to everything elders say. But you have to learn how to, dis how to respectfully disagree. Or keep silence. You have many choices. And the African culture usually have that kind of flexibility that enables people to do things without hurting, hurting the various parties involved. So take the time and you'll find the guidance you need. I believe I've touched, touched everything that you've mentioned. I don't know if Brother Macaul wants to add something. Um, you know, the Sister Nayasha, I, I, uh, I think that you used the interesting word psychosis, and um, I'd have to figure out more about what the Greeks thought it meant and then go further back to see how they learned what it meant from the commitments. But um, you use it in tandem with intergenerational and trauma and, and the like. And uh, the only thing I could lightly and quickly um, suggest on that is that I found that the difficult parts of my genealogy that I was looking at, you, you're not just going to find the sweet, you're going to find the bitter too, okay? It requires a lot of work, okay? So, and also it requires that you go to where your ancestors were. If you have the ability to do that, I don't, I don't know. But um, if that involves uh, travel or that involves um, making your way to better contextualize where the, what, what conditions their lives were under and um, coming to, to what they were going through. Um, the one example that I have is that I went um, into a small southern rural town that, uh, that a, city, a city hall that had the records that I was looking, I thought I might be able to find some great grandparents' uh, birth or marriage records or something I was trying to find on this one ancestor. Frank Plant Pickle Smith <laughs> is what I, I was told from family. And I had to go through a few days of books and books and books, like piles and piles of um, records of birth. And it went from uh, 1850, and I went page by page by page by page in the county where they lived, right? So I was a little better contextualized to their lives. And I went through and, it's, and it had black and white separated because the enslaved was the black and the white was the human or the American. And then after a while it changed to, um, you know, they were listing the woman now who was giving birth. And then the, you know, I was going through marriage records and it listed the woman, the, the people who were married. And then the, the census taker, the record keeper in that city hall, he changed over from saying master of this to owner. So there was different changes and I was going page by page. And then all of a sudden I see black people being listed as married. And unless I had gone through the thousands of pages before and seen the changes of the writing and the documents, it wouldn't have struck me, well, what the hell happened and what year was it that this change happened? And it would happen to be the end of the war, uh, Civil War. So black folks got free in this Southern little town and they were of a courage to say, put my baby in this book for the first time. And how many ever generations? The actual tenure of black folks in what would become the United States is longer than any other people than the native people. It's 1765 on average, okay? And so 
they could have been there for 200 years before they they were able to be in a position to say i am a man i'm going to go get my people recognized so all of a sudden this man i didn't find his record there but all of a sudden i know what his neighborhood was was like 100 years 115 years ago you know and so if you can do that in your context i'm sorry you say namibia or or whatever section you're in if you have a context for getting back to where they live and find a meaningful way to connect with how they live um that's a big step to overcoming any kind of intergenerational carrying on of something you're breaking something big when you do that that's all that i i could say on that you know all right thank you thank you um sister nayasha thank you for your questions great questions all right okay so we are well it's two minutes to 3 p.m guys we have two more questions um so uh what we'll do is we'll try to make the questions very quickly one question one part not one question three parts so uh, we do one quick question and then we try to get those answers into you guys very quickly, okay? So um, next question comes from Kayla, Kayla Paulino. You could go ahead and unmute yourself, ask your question, please. Hi, um, I was gonna ask a question, but since we only have two minutes, I just really wanna say thank you because um, I believe that the truth does bring us much closer to freedom and I appreciate you both so much. I've worked in the South Bronx teaching second and third grade. And um, Haiti, the first black republic, is a tool that I've used with the youth and they are so brilliant. They understand so much at a very young age. As you were talking about, um, the other brother McCall was speaking about the thing with the dolls. These babies still come into class thinking white is more beautiful. But as we teach um, the truth, they end the semester saying black is beautiful, very proud. Um, so really, like sheroes of the Haitian Revolution, thank you, Baina, uh, Professor Baina, for that work because there's so many. I just got that book, and I've just been telling everybody about it, taking it everywhere I go. These women, you know, I have not heard of so many of them, and thank you for doing that work. Um, in terms of the brother talking about Dominican Republic, we have so much work to do to decolonize. There is so much internalized anti-blackness in the Dominican Republic. And that is only because of the ignorance um, that we do not even know the richness of Africa. So thank you for your work. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sister Kayla. I appreciate the love and support. I've seen you on Instagram uh, sharing uh, the books, you know, She Rose and, and Haiti and everything. So thank you so much for your support. We appreciate you. Thank you. Um, so much. One last um, question. Can I have Baba McCall's number or contact or uh, email address? France, France will take care of um, thank, connecting. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Brother McCall, if you want to uh, share any of your contact information in the chat where people could contact. Right, right, right. That would be great. Okay, next question comes from Wajit. Wajit, we can't have a show without Wajit question, so. Um, yes, hello. Peace and blessings, France. Peace and blessings, my Bello and Brother McCall. I just really have a, I don't, I don't really have a big question either. I just want to say thank you for coming on to the space and sharing with us and providing us with your knowledge. And um, also wanted to relate with you on um, on something that you and Brother Bon Thompson was talking about. How um, you know, in my in my upbringing as well, we weren't taught to. I wasn't at least in my family. We weren't taught to really look back and to research and to see. You know. Because my family, they're from Guyana, and I was born in Barbados. And then if I ask, okay, what about our African roots? They'll be like, oh, well, what, you know, what I've heard from a lot of family members was, well, you know, once you find out about that, what's next? Like, there's no value in it. So I appreciate you coming onto this space and, and, and sharing your knowledge and providing, you know, the young youth with, with, mentor, with mentorship and doing what you do in teaching. And uh, I also want to ask Marbello, um, are there any books that you could recommend about different family structures and polygamy and polyamory and things like that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, right off the top of my head, no book on that subject. Maybe next time. Okay. Uh, All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Ajit. All right, uh, that concludes our program for this afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining us and special shout out and thank you to Brother Joel McCall. And thanks for sharing the knowledge. Thanks for sharing your work. Very, very important um, that we find ways to connect with our ancestors, uh, connect with our, um, our, our bloodlines. You know, the more we know, about our family's history, the more the more we know about you know ourselves and and our future. So, definitely important work. We appreciate you, brother. Thanks for sharing your time and knowledge with us. Let's I give thanks right back at you, brother Franz, and and thank you again, my Bella, for the opportunity to to uh, speak with the circle here. Was Thank this information you. put in the chat? Yeah, make sure, Brother McCall, you put if you have any information to share, uh, you can share it in the chat, or if you could, you could just email it to me, and then I'll send it out to everybody um, after the after the program is over. Well, I think I, I sent it privately to somebody, but now I got it to everybody. Oh, okay, all right, yeah, I do that sometimes. <laughs> okay, no problem. Thank you, thank you, Brother McCall. Peace and blessings, man. Um, you know, continue, continue uh, the great work. All right, and. Um, Okay, so that's the end of our program. So I'll send it back to Professor Bayina Bello to give us a final word. Thank you, Franz. In the name of all those who understand, who understood that freedom is the only objective worth fighting for. In the name of those who taught for freedom, who fought, excuse me, who fought for freedom and all those who set freedom as an objective for the next 21 generations. That should be our aim. 21 generations ahead. I bid you to go in peace, for that is the way of the just. However, always keep your shields up and your guards attentive. Remember that any time truth is tempered with, justice is at risk. And when justice is discarded, the equilibrium of our cosmos is endangered. Guardians of this planet, we are the guardians of this universe. We must assume our duty. We must take charge of ourselves so we can take care of our duties. Be blessed, be healthy, be powerful, be your divine self. Till next time. Ashay. Ashay, thank you, Professor. Peace and blessings Hello. to all. Blessings. All right, everybody. Thank Thanks. You thank, you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. All of you. Next Thursday for another episode. Everybody, have a great weekend. Take care. See you next week. Peace. Take hey, good care. Peace. Thank Peace. you very much. Peace.